Bernard, can you just tell me about your little daughter, Sophia, and the issues that you've had in terms of accessing uh, what she needs? Well, so Sophia, uh, she's eight now. So she was born eight years ago and she was born with uh, spina bifida and hydrocephalus. So from a very early age, we were told she was going to be uh, in a wheelchair. So, um, yeah, so she had a she had, she had a hard start. Uh, her first six months of life spent in Temple Street and uh, you'd have to admire how they work under the conditions they work in there. So it was it, it was very hard uh, in the beginning, but that didn't prepare us for how hard it was going to be once she left the hospital, because uh, we we were about to start the worst recession that you could you could have lived through, and there was no supports and no services when you came out. So you came out and you brought your child home, and. Uh, you got your visit from your public health nurse and that was it. Uh, everything else you had to do, you had to do it yourself. So you had to you had to find out what services were available, get your name on the list and hope that you would be accepted into those services as soon as you could. And um, we were told we were very fortunate. Uh, we, uh, we were accepted into services within seven months. So for that seven months, we, we just, we just tried to do as best you could. And um, Temple Street were very good. They gave us as much support as they could. But in the community, there, there, there really is, you have a public health nurse and they're not equipped for the issues that, that arise. Um, we did eventually get into a service and that service is very good. But we're made to feel we're very fortunate that we have that service. We constantly meet families who don't have that service. And um, one of the, actually, one of the, 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 the biggest things was uh, at a year and a half, Sophia went into her first wheelchair. But uh, when we applied for a wheelchair, we were told by the department, we, we don't, she's very young, we don't, we don't supply wheelchairs for a child that young. And I was very, very amused by this because her diagnosis was there. She was never going to walk and she, her peers were walking. So, so we had to fund it. So that was a three and a half thousand euro expense that we incurred to put our daughter into her wheelchair, which was the best thing we ever did. But at the same time, I had to have given up work to be a full time carer. So the, the, that's the first financial hit we experienced. And then it just that's just the start of it. So um, when it comes to uh, her medical needs, they are met, but you have to fight for everything. So you have to, for like just continents and all these other resources, they, you have to wait, your child is three. So up to that point, you have to provide everything, which is, is a big financial, uh, financial cost. Um, and then you're always looking ahead at, you know, I have to adapt to my home. What are we going to do there? How are we going to go about that? If you're fortunate to have a home, and um, one of the other big issues out there is families with children with complex needs who are living in social housing and there's just no social housing available for them. And I know families that are eight and 10 years on this and their children are that age now. They're living in homes with wheelchairs that are not fit for purpose. And um, so this again compounds your issue at home with a child with a disability. You're trying your best you're trying to keep things as normal as possible, but you're always coming up against these brick walls. And one thing people always used to say to me when Sophia was very small was, you're going to have to fight for the rest of her life for everything. And these were from older parents. And I never really, I was always like, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand exactly what they meant. And then as, we got, as she got older and her, her needs changed, I, I soon realized letters going missing um, we didn't get that paperwork um, no there's no funds for that uh, we can't arrange that and so you spend a lot of time on the phone you spend a lot of time going to offices I learned very early on that um, if something was needed and there was a report uh, written out I would take a copy and I would go to the office and I would sit for hours waiting for someone to take that report off me and then I would get them to sign a piece of paper and they'd like why am I signing this I just want you to say you took this report and I found when that was done 
things happened a lot quicker. So reports didn't go missing anymore and reports weren't in the wrong tray anymore. But um, the, the, then obviously we were in a recession and that was one of the, the, the biggest things that was used against us. We have no, we have no funds. There's no funds there. Um, more than once I was asked on the phone if I had private health insurance, could you fund this yourself? And uh, like, it was irrelevant whether I did or not. That was the reality of it. My, my daughter didn't. She's a citizen of the state. But it kept falling back on the family, the responsibility. And you're made to feel sort of guilty if you can't provide these things for your child. And it was, it was a weapon that they seemed to use regularly. You know, is there any way, could the community come together, maybe do a fundraiser? So, I mean, as if you hadn't enough to be doing, you had to think about these things. I mean, if you have a great support network, you're, you're, you're very fortunate like that. But so many families don't have that. And um, we've met a lot of women, actually, and spoken to a lot of women before who have children with special needs who have found it extremely difficult to uh, get assessment of needs for their children. Uh, and you were just saying to me earlier something about that and uh, in terms of what the government is doing or... <laughs> in this case, not doing properly? Well, the assessment of need is a, is a legal requirement that when uh, a child is presented with uh, um, characteristics of uh, particularly autism, um, three months, an assessment of need, and then three months later into services. And that's a legal requirement. That's law. And uh, it's actually at the moment it's about two to two and a half years. So the state is actually breaking its own law and what you're finding is there's a whole industry after after uh, after uh, coming up now which is uh, a lot of um, uh, healthcare professions who would have been in the public domain have moved into the private uh, i think an assessment of need costs about 460 euro so like any parent would want to have their child assessed so they're they're paying that so there's an industry that's after building up off the back of the fact that the state is negating its responsibility, its own laws, it's breaking. So you've got families then who, uh, if they're fortunate enough, they can afford that. They, they do. And they're still waiting years to get into services because there's particular when it comes to the autistic services and the, the intellectual special needs services are they're, they're, they're just on the ground. I mean, they're just overwhelmed. And um, people, I know a lot of people that would go to the UK that's what you have to do. They have to go to the UK to get their services. They go over and they pay for it and because they want to give their child that chance. They might go up the north as well to, to, to give their child um, a fighting chance. But that's the state of play. That's exactly where we're at, that the, the, the country, the law that's there, stating that you have to do this within three months and then three months into services, it's illegal and they're breaking it every day. It's, it's I think down in in Munster, there's they reckon they need four hundred um, psychologists just to to clear the backlog of assessment and Eve. And people they're just lost. They don't know what to do. They have a child there that are, is losing out on vital years where they could inter, they could have interventions that they could help their child become better adults as opposed to being left just they're just in limbo they don't know what to do and that's only going that only leads on then as the child gets older obviously it, it, you've missed the window of opportunity and so it puts more pressure on services as, as going forward like so yeah and can you just tell me you have a meeting tomorrow evening um with regards to uh public transport for wheelchair users in particular can you just tell me a little bit about the issues that you have encountered with regards to public transport well we're having a public meeting tomorrow evening in relation to uh, dart services and the state of play when it comes to uh, a wheelchair user or someone with mobility impairment using the train service the station here in clontarf is uh, it's three three flights of stairs up so you have to have the lifts working and the lifts are constantly out. I'm constantly getting texts from people saying lifts out of action again, lifts out of order again. So for people who have uh, mobility issues, if you're a wheelchair user, if you're an elderly person, you go down, that's that's that train station. That's you just can't use it. So one of the, one of the reasons I got involved in in politics in uh, I, I initially started with uh, 
campaigning for the ratification of the protocol for people with disabilities was a young man from Dunleary whose partner is in Clontarf and he would use the train but because the lifts were constantly out some days it could take Sean six to seven hours to get from Dunleary to his partner's house in Clontarf which is just unbelievable in this day and age you, you would walk quicker and when you do uh, when you ring up you ask uh, what's why are these uh, lifts constantly out of order? You're told uh, it's because of antisocial behaviour. Um, but what it's turned out now on investigation, it's because I feel they privatised the contracts for maintenance. Uh, there was an incident in Clontarf two weeks ago where a woman was uh, trapped in the lift and they rang the company that deals with the contract for maintenance and they said it would be four to six hours before they could get out. So the station rang the fire brigade and they cut her out in 20 minutes. So what the state has done by privatizing these essential contracts, it's just, it's, it's just, it's impacting upon people with mobility issues. The fact too, that you have to ring if you want to use the train services down the country, 24 hours in, in advance, uh, four to 12 hours for the dart if you're a wheelchair user and you want to use the, the train so you can't just say uh, i'll go into town or i'll meet someone and um, you have to ring ahead to hope that someone will be there to man the ramp that could be put on um on the train so you can you can get on and off um again that's that's discrimination like it really is so because of your disability you're being discriminated but it's state-sponsored discrimination they it all boils down to they say the resources aren't there but it's due to cuts so many thousand odd guards train guards were retired and never replaced and the impact that has is on the community that's got issues with their mobility and, and uh, can you just maybe tell me the the details of the meeting again just so that you can let people know the details are the, it's going to be on in Lakela in Clontarf on the Alfie Byrne Road tomorrow evening at uh, 7.30. So this is going to be uh, myself and uh, John Lyons and we have uh, a representative from the Transport uh, Authority who's going to come out and he's going to discuss the issues that people face. And in general, we're just going to, we're going to have a consultation with the community to say what they feel going forward, especially it's also to do with overcrowding. They've reduced down the number of uh, of um, cars on the the trains from eight to six this is having an impact again with wheelchair users as well but also just the general public the 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 trains are just crazy and they say it's supposed to be a more frequent service but from we've been uh, leafleting down at the station these last two weeks and they said there's no there's no improved service if anything it's gotten worse because you've overcrowding the trains aren't running on time they, they people just don't know what's what's going on and and yet there is no no response when you ring the nta and you try to find out what's the the theory and the methodology behind it they they can't uh they just say you know stuff for a f- better faster more frequent service but as far as we can see it's actually overcrowding is worse due to this uh this particular initiative that they're trying to implement 